No, no build up at all there, Emma. Thanks for that um, introduction. As, as Stefan says, you know, as trade unionists, we need to have, as anti imperialists and trade unionists, we need to have a collective industrial international um, strategy to tackle the arms trade. Um, but full disclosure at the beginning, I don't represent, um, shall we say, defence workers. So what I was wanting to focus on more was dispelling some of the common misconceptions that are put out there, frankly, by some leaders in the trade union movement around organised labour and the arms trade. And as Emma says, you know, how important it is to engage workers in the movement against it. Um, this kind of perceived false dichotomy that, that definitely exists in, in the minds of uh, the media in some ways, and as I say, in the minds of some uh, trade union uh, leaders, the idea that, that there's a false dichotomy between workers and imperialism, that, you know, the workerist model, which perpetuates the myth that workers don't care about anything other than their own short-term benefit. Of, of wages and conditions but actually it's been proven through the history of, of workers movements and collective actions workers have always cared about the arms trade they've always cared about bombs being dropped um, on working people ar around the world um, so I thought it would be helpful in a wee bit of a shot in the arm um, in, this, in this current climate to provide you with just a few examples many of you will, will, will have heard of them or, or um, know that they happened. A few examples around the world, world where workers have collectively tackled the cabal that is the global arms trade and they've won. They've, they've you know, uh, actions by the very rank and file of, of organised labour that stretches well beyond their wages and their conditions um, and it's actually saved thousands of lives um, around the world. Probably the most well-known one, uh, the one that I think hits home to um, people in Scotland and the UK is, is the example of the, the, the workers in the Rolls-Royce um, factory in East Kilbride um, who refused to work on the Chilean Air Force parts that were moving through uh, under Heath's um, government um, and they were being used to kill uh, civilians by the Pinochet dictatorship. They were used... Um, to overthrow the IND government. Um, but in a nutshell, this was workers coming together, you know, 50 years ago now, um, just a few miles down the road from where I am in the south side of Glasgow, um, who managed to disrupt one of the most notoriously vicious post-war regimes. Um, workers who, for all intents and purposes, could have been pigeonholed as workers who only cared about wages and conditions, but actually they were led by anti-imperialists. They were led by trade unionists who also made the link um, between what was going on in Latin America with what was being done to their wages here. Um, even those who um, might not have made those links, there, there was a lot of uh, detractors even within uh, the membership at the Rolls-Royce factory. Um, were soon educated. Uh, the union went about educating very quickly, very radically, the workforce who may not have agreed with the leadership, and I mean the, the, the rank and file leadership, the conveners who took the action. Um, but soon a, a consensus was developed, an anti-imperialist perspective was developed through collective struggle. Um, I mean, the history of uh, dock workers uh, taking collective action to stop the trade of weapons being used to kill civilians around the world is even uh, stronger and longer. Um, it was only in March 2017 um, that a, a fireman uh, called Ignacio Robles, I hope I'm saying that right, um, was em em employed by the port of Bilbao, refused to collaborate in the loading of the Barry vessel um, with arms that was going to Saudi Arabia. Um, he was disciplined, his employer tried to sack him and over the course of the next year a range of grassroots groups in Bilbao including refugee rights organisations, um, Passage Sejoro and Onji Yatori, um, Greenpeace, local feminist movements um, undertook a series of actions at the port 
including uh, occupying the, the ships themselves. The, the tactics that they used, uh, essentially a port blockade, was quite a fitting one because, as, as folk will know, the Saudi blockade at the port of Hodeida um, and other measures have deprived much of Yemen's civilian population of, of basic necessities to live. Um, but as a result of the protests that started with that one worker refusing to take action, uh, Barry made the decision in 2018 in March to pull its business out of the port entirely. Um, these actions soon spread to France, where the CGT union, uh, the dock worker section, um, sprang into action and refused to load the same ships at Le Havre um, in France. From there, the ship headed to the port of Genoa in Italy, um, inspired by the example of the French activists, the port workers and Italian dock workers um, jumped into action and, and, and shut down the, or refused to load the ship. Um, again, uh, an incredible rank and file political collective, including dock workers, um, anti-fascists, international solidarity across the city, pushed for the blockade of, of the cargo and, and won. Um, and, and, and stopped it being loaded altogether. Um, but these tactics effectively bolt blockades or follow the bolt, as, as, as they were um, called, you know, obviously didn't start in the 90s, but one of the most famous um, examples was with the Neptune Jade, which wasn't necessarily um, arms being traded, but it was seen to be scab cargo um, that was being moved from... Uh, Liverpool to the States to Canada to Japan and every dock was met with some form of a, an action or movement um, that eventually meant that it was stopped in its tracks altogether but most famously probably as uh, Stefan commented on after Operation Cast Lead and um, the, the BDS movement in full swing managed to um, blockade the, the Zim shipping line which was supported by the ILWU um, and the states. Um, really what started is community activists spread to the dock workers themselves, the unionised and non-unionised dock workers who refused to cross the picket line and then forced the shipping giant to pull out of the US uh, west coast altogether. Um, I don't know if someone has any other information, but I don't think they've came back in the last seven years, which is an amazing feet if you think about the billions of dollars that that that, that um, Israeli um, shipping line would have lost uh, just in the last few years. But these examples show the collective power of workers, obviously. And in, in my biased view, uh, you know, the greatest vessel of change when it comes to disrupting the stranglehold that the arms industry has over the world economy and the economy of post-colonial states. For me, the greatest antidote to the poison of the war industry is workers collectively disrupting it. Um, only workers, through the threat of withdrawing their labour, um, have the tangible power to actually force the hand of companies um, like Raytheon, like BAE Systems, to actually uh, break that unfettered, undemocratic, murderous link that they have or power sorry that they have with over nation states and it's really quite shocking actually someone who doesn't have a huge knowledge about the the, the arms trade in scotland to hear some of the examples that stefan's given of just how hypocritical this government's been and actually the pretty good job they've done of spinning the idea that there's some sort of progressive um progressive state or more so than, than any other nation state but there's in my view less altruistic reasons why unions should take their moral obligations with regards to campaigning against armed trade seriously um, because the transnational trade of weapons and exploitation of workers go hand in hand they're inextricably linked as Stefan says you know the use of arms and riot gear and um, to suppress working people in the US or, or, or civil rights movements. We, we have a, a, it's not just an obligation as a movement, you know, we're actually defending our own here. But I think there's a, a final reason why union leaders um, should be more engaged in actively breaking apart those links between 
post-colonial governments and, and arms dealers um, because it, it matters to the newest generation of workers. Um, I organise hospitality workers and the average age of our member is 23. It's the, it's the youngest um, it's the youngest section of the trade union movement. Um, they care about they they care about the arms trade. They they got involved, um, you know. They they became politicised in the climate strikes. They care passionately about the world around them, and 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 they made the political links between austerity at home, and the war abroad. Um, enraged by the the idea that for the last 10, 11 years, the NHS has been deprived of um, the money that it needs, but yet we're doubling the amount of money spent on defence. Um, I myself, you know, I'm, I'm ancient compared to people like Emma and the younger activists that are coming through uh, the, the, the hospitality section, but I myself got involved as a trade unionist because of the war in Iraq, because of what happened in, in Gaza. So I think my final plea to those trade union leaders, which is ultimately my, my main, um, what I want to get out of this event as well as learn um, a lot more about the arms trade, is, is, is a plea to, to trade union leaders who frankly have taken that workerist approach. Um, we need to reach out. It's not only the right thing to do to save millions of working people's lives, but actually it will reach out to the newest generation of workers who hitherto now don't see trade unions by and large to be speaking to them as anti-imperialists, as environmentalists, as people who care about the arms trade. But I'll leave it there just now, Emma.